Matematik har ett vart blivit ett väldigt viktigt verktyg i vetenskapen också i biologin, men man kan stussa lite när 1 plus 1 equals 1. Det kan bara ske i biologin. Många har sagt att biologin är ett av de mest komplexa fagfältena som finns. Och John Archibald från Dalhousie University i Kanada, han har vid stora delar av sitt liv till att forska på nettop hur detta är möjligt. Och nu ska han ta oss genom intet mindre än organellens historia plus lite till. Ta gott emot John Archibald. and a privilege to be here, um, thanks to Kirsten and the uh, other, other organizers. Um, uh, we are all comfortable with the idea that um, in textbooks, uh, we are told that mitochondria and plastids or chloroplasts are of prokaryotic ancestry. They evolved uh, by endosymbiosis. This is what we, uh, many of us learned um, as students, and it's what we tell our young students. Um, but of course, um, it wasn't always that way. Uh, as someone educated in the modern molecular and genomic era, I uh, was at times embarrassed by how little I knew about the history of my field, and so the, the book that was mentioned several times uh, already today um, was in part a, uh, an effort to better understand how uh, the field of, of symbiosis and biology uh, has reached the point that it, that it has. What I'm going to do today um, is to uh, weave together some stories that uh, obviously include um, uh, a lot of discussion about Lynn Margulis, um, but also a discussion of, of Jostein Goxoyer, who um, I'll be honest and say that I know, uh, knew and know, still know very little about. And part of the reason I jumped at the opportunity to come here on this trip is to better uh, understand his contribution. Uh, very, very much an important but under uh, uh, poorly understood and, and known uh, contribution to science. So that's essentially what I'm uh, hoping to do today. Uh, as we'll see, the, the, the uh, roots of symbiotic theory and biology run deep, so I'm going to touch on the sort of pre-molecular era, going back to the late 1800s, early, early 1900s. Um, touch on this transition period where we moved from uh, uh, hypotheses about how organelles evolved and are related to one another through to actually testing the endosymbiont hypothesis using molecular data. And then I'm going to finish off by discussing and presenting some modern perspectives on, on endosymbiotic theory uh, as informed by uh, comparative genomics. So if I were to, to pick a random sample of biologists, uh, not, not this audience, but um, uh, any, any audience uh, somewhere, somewhere else and not today, and ask them who came up with the idea of, of endosymbiosis. Most people would say uh, uh, it was Lynn Margulis, the, the late American biologist. Um, like the eventual acceptance of continental drift, acceptance of a symbiotic theory of cell evolution has often been hailed as a scientific revolution. The woman most responsible for bringing the idea to respectability is, is Lynn Margulis. A prolific writer and dynamic speaker, Margulis captivates audiences and often irritates more traditional biologists with her unorthodox ideas. Although many biologists continue to disagree with some of her ideas, everyone takes into symbiosis seriously. And uh, that is true today, I believe, um, but certainly was not true for a long uh, time uh, prior to, to the late 1960s. And as you've heard, um, 
both Lynn and Jostein uh, independently came upon their, their ideas of, of where organelles in eukaryotic cells came from. And so again, my, my goal today is to try and contextualize uh, those 1967 papers in a, in a broader picture of uh, uh, biology moving forward. So let's start uh, from the beginning, I suppose. Um, Simon uh, Schwendener, a Swiss biologist, is, is thought to have been the first to seriously think about this, this question. He studied lichens, and lichens, as many of you know, will, uh, are a, uh, a symbiosis between two distinct organisms, uh, usually a green alga and a, a fungus of some kind. Um, at this particular time, in the, in the 1860s, uh, thereabouts, um, this was a controversial idea. Biologists were still trying to understand and think about the taxonomy of living beings, how organisms were related to one another, how uh, uh, traits were passed down through generations. And so here was a case where um, we were thinking about an organism that was in fact two organisms. In some cases you can tease apart the uh, two organisms that comprise a, lich a lichen, uh, grow them separately, and then put them back together to reconstitute the organism. So this was a very controversial, uh, heretical idea at the time. Uh, de Berry is thought to have uh, coined the term symbiosis, uh, which we can define as the living together of distinct organisms. And so you, you can see from these dates here, uh, the general concept of symbiosis goes back a long, long way. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about one of these three individuals, um, a Russian by the name of Konstantin Merzhkovsky. Uh, these uh, three are often referred to as the Russian symbiogeneticists, and that, that word uh, symbiogenesis is not uh, heard very often. Uh, roughly speaking, it's... Um, not, not just symbiosis where two organisms live together, but it is the, uh, the, the creation uh, of a new single organism by the partnership, bringing together of two organisms to produce um, uh, a single uh, being. Hence the, the title of the book, One Plus One Equals, equals One. So Marischkovsky uh, was active um, in the early uh, 1900s. And in 1905, he published uh, this paper, which fortunately for me was translated uh, from German into English in 1999 by Martin and Kovalik. Uh, the title of that paper, On the Nature and Origin of Chromatophores, or Chloroplasts, uh, in the Plant Kingdom. And so I'll just now uh, sketch uh, an outline of, of what it was that Marischkowski uh, said in this paper, and I encourage you to, to read it. It's uh, eminently readable. Um, Marischkowski had spent uh, a lot of time studying microorganisms, including diatoms, so single-celled algae. Um, he was aware of the work on lichens, so he had been primed to thinking about symbiosis in biology. Um, and from studying the ultrastructure of diatoms and other microbes, he knew that people like uh, Andreas Schimper had thought deeply about chloroplasts and their biology in the context of plant and algal cells. And so uh, he was aware of this concept of what's called the, the continuity of chromatophores or chloroplasts. This is the idea that uh, chloroplasts do not uh, arise de novo from within uh, a cell, a plant or an algal cell, they, chloroplasts come from pre-existing chloroplasts by division. So uh, Marischkowski was aware of that concept. And of course, like many uh, uh, biologists, uh, botanists at the time, um, he was impressed by the obvious similarities between uh, the chloroplasts of plants and algae and the uh, biology of uh, the blue-green algae, or cyanobacteria. So the, the, the idea that uh, oxygenic photosynthesis is something that is common to both of those uh, types of organisms, this was something that was uh, seen as a very strong link between 
uh, cyanobacteria on the one hand and the intracellular chloroplasts of plants and algae. And finally, he, uh, well read as he was, he was aware of the fact that uh, there were lots of examples of um, symbiosis in biology, not just lichens, but also cases of organisms, one organism living inside another. And I'm going to touch on this particular example, an organism called Pollinella, towards the end of my, towards the end of my talk. So all of this came together uh, in this paper, which is widely held as the first uh, fully articulated version of the endosymbiont hypothesis for chloroplasts. I should say, although Marischkowski is is sort of hailed as the, the father of symbiotic theory, it, it's actually the case that he rejected the idea that mitochondria were of endosymbiotic origin. This particular paper was all about chloroplasts. Okay. So, moving forward a little bit uh, in time, we can discuss some of the uh, other people proposing symbiotic ideas in, in science. One uh, very uh, interesting and curious example of that is this book, uh, Les Symbiotes, published by a Frenchman, Paul Portier, in 1918. Now, Portier was a, uh, trained as a, as a medic, um, but he was really someone who was interested in, in physiology um, in a comparative sense, so he was interested in the diversity of organisms. Um, he actually did some of the uh, important work that led to the discovery of uh, anaphylaxis, and uh, he was some of his work was um, supported and sponsored by the uh, Prince of Monaco. Um, his uh, supervisor, uh, Richelet, uh, as you can see on the uh, the slide here, um, actually won a Nobel Prize for that work. Uh, Porche did not, although he did get his head on a on a postage stamp, I guess, as a consolation prize. Uh, in this book, uh, Portier um, posited the idea that not only were uh, mitochondria related to bacteria, they, they quite literally were bacteria, and that they played a role in uh, all manner of, of important processes in, in living organisms everything from uh, developmental biology to speciation uh, to cancer and, and so forth. So it was a, a broad sweeping uh, treatise on uh, the importance of mitochondria in uh, the biology of all eukaryotic cells. Uh, unfortunately for Portier, uh, the following year, uh, a book was published with the following title, uh, Le Myth des Symbiotes, which um, kind of uh, took the wind out of his sails, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, the criticism here uh, essentially was that uh, microbiologists uh, studying at places like the Pasteur Institute were still trying to understand uh, microbiology and what uh, the role that bacteria had in, in the living world, and their feeling was that uh, bacteria were bad. Uh, they caused disease, and that um, whatever these mitochondria were, um, they simply could have nothing to do with bacteria because they just did not have anything uh, good uh, to do for, for the cells. And I won't read that quote, but you can see that uh, the review, anonymous review in, in Nature, did not go over particularly well. Uh, Portier did carry on in science, but he did not uh, again publish in uh, the realm of, of symbiosis. Uh, in North America was an American by the name of Ivan Wallen, who was an anatomy professor at the University of Colorado, and for reasons that have never been uh, clear to certainly myself or anyone that I know, um, he uh, got interested in the idea that mitochondria, uh, like Portier uh, believed, were um, bacteria and that they caused uh, all sorts of, or were, were sort of central to very important aspects of um, cell biology. Um, like Portier, um, Wallen believed that uh, the evidence for the bacterial origin of mitochondria was to prove that they could be cultured, and in fact, uh, Wallen and Porche both uh, claimed to have uh, cultured mitochondria outside of the, the cell. 
This is a, an image from uh, one of his notebooks, and you can see uh, on the right-hand side are his hand-drawn uh, facsimiles of uh, the microbes that he was claimed to have cultured from his uh, samples. Certainly through the lens of modern molecular biology, we know that this uh, uh, could not possibly be true. Um, you know, in hindsight, uh, Wallen and Porche were probably culturing um, contaminating bacteria, but uh, the idea that um, there was a clear connection between mitochondria on the one hand and bacteria on the other, um, the, the, the ideas are, are really quite old. Um, so we can ask the question, why is it that if these ideas were, were around for, for such a long time, why did it take so long for them to take hold and be, be, gain some certain level of respectability? Well, there's lots of different ways to think about that question. One way that um, makes sense to me is to think about what people were studying at the time and learning about. Um, people like... Uh, the Drosophila ge geneticist uh, Morgan, you know, at this time people were still trying to understand the nature of heredity and Morgan uh, did pioneering work, as you may know, on, on uh, the role of chromosomes in um, heredity and people like Morgan were essentially saying that the cytoplasm where mitochondria and chloroplasts reside uh, could be ignored um, genetically. Um, Morgan, uh, we, we didn't quite know that DNA was the hereditary material, but we knew that um, chromosomes, which were uh, related somehow to heredity, they were in the nucleus. So you could basically ignore everything that wasn't inside the nucleus. So if you didn't uh, have much of a vested interest in, in symbiosis, uh, if someone like Morgan said that um, we can ignore the cytoplasm, well then that's, uh, that was good enough for, for you. Um, it's, it's not clear whether Morgan had ever actually heard of, of some of these early ideas about symbiosis, but someone else who was very important actually had. Uh, uh, Wilson was the author of a very important series of textbooks uh, on cell biology, and uh, he was aware of the early uh, Russian symbiogeneticists uh, and, their, and Wallen as well. He knew about those ideas, he just didn't find them very interesting. Um, on Marischkovsky, uh, entertaining fantasy. On Wallen, too fantastic for discussion in polite biological discourse. So, the ideas were there. Uh, Lynn Margulis, as, as I've said, gets the lion's share of the credit as, as having championed the endosymbiont hypothesis. Now she's, uh, most, I think most people would recognize her as a theoretician, um, but it is a, in fact the case that she, uh, early on in her career at least, was an experimentalist. There's a list of um, some of her uh, earliest papers published uh, with the last name uh, Sagan or Sagan. She was married for a short time to the uh, famous astronomer and popularizer of science, uh, Carl uh, Sagan. So she did some experiments in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s, providing indirect evidence for the presence of nucleic acids in the cytoplasm of microorganisms, uh, euglena and an amoeba. Um, so she was uh, primed to thinking about uh, symbiosis. She was a uh, student of several people who did uh, pioneering work on electron microscopy. One of her mentors was uh, a man named Hans Ries, who uh, was one of the first people to show that there was DNA present in mitochondria and chloroplasts, and so she really had a front row seat to uh, people who were exploring the, the possibility, possibility that these organelles were of endosymbiotic origin. Um, uh, Hans Ries and a man named Walter Plout had said as much in some papers in the, in the early 60s, uh, alluding to this fact, but not saying it very strongly. And the paper that she uh, is most famous for published as Lynn Sagan, as you know, on the origin of mitosing cells in 1967. She posited in that paper that uh, there were not two, but in fact three 
uh, eukaryotic organelles of endosymbiotic origin, not just the mitochondria and the plastids or chloroplasts, but also the motility apparatus of eukaryotic cells, so the flagellum. She believed um, that this was also of endosymbiotic origin, in this case from a spirochete, uh, and she believed that uh, until the day she, she died. Uh, it's an idea that's never really taken hold and has had no uh, experimental uh, support for, uh, but it didn't matter to her. Uh, this is the paper, uh, Jostein's paper, that uh, we've uh, heard a bit about already. And what I'd like to do is, is to uh, uh, illustrate what I think are some of the important aspects of, the, of this particular paper. Um, essentially, what, what was proposed was that the eukaryotic cell, uh, if we start from the top left there, what was actually a a merger uh, of multiple distinct lines of bacterial cells, as you can see, with the DNA accumulating in the middle of the cell, and that we uh, ended up with a nucleated organism. And in the red box, we have um, a symbiotic relationship between uh, this sort of early eukaryote with a nucleus and a prokaryotic organism. Um, and this was essentially the, uh, posited as the progenitor of, of the mitochondrion. Now, if you look closely there, you can see some uh, lines moving from the small circles uh, pointing in towards the nucleus. And so I think one of uh, underappreciated fact is that Jostein was, was, to my knowledge, only one of two people in the early days who posited the idea that one of the important things that takes place during uh, endosymbiogenesis is the transfer of genetic material from one organism to another. Okay, so these are his words. Um, during further evolution, the aerobic partner must necessarily have lost autonomy, loss of DNA. This DNA may have become incorporated into the nuclear DNA, and I'm going to uh, revisit that issue. Uh, the last line on this slide uh, is also Jostein's words, uh, DNA RNA hybridization experiments between blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, and the chloroplasts of other algae might, have, might give some information. So he posited two separate uh, endosymbiotic origins for mitochondria and also chloroplasts, and discussed the idea that genetic material would have moved from one to the other, and, and predicted that we might be able to test these ideas using molecular uh, sequence data. Uh, in some ways, Margulis is more famous for this uh, uh, book. Um, she, by this point, she had changed uh, names uh, to, to Margulis, obviously. Um, uh, this picture shows uh, Hans Rees in the middle, one of her, one of her mentors, and a uh, South African-born um, uh, biologist by the name of Max Taylor on the right-hand side. So this picture was taken in 19... Um, 75. So let's think now um, about the ability uh, of, to use molecular data to test the endosymbiont hypothesis. So what were the competing views um, that we could use such data to test? Well, on the left is, is what uh, can be considered the sort of dogma at the time, uh, and that is essentially the idea that um, chloroplasts uh, evolved vertically. In fact, eukaryotic cells evolved vertically from prokaryotes. Again, remember that uh, we had plants, and plants were uh, physiologically a lot like uh, blue-green algae in terms of oxygenic photosynthesis, and so the idea was that the ancestral eukaryote had evolved from a, a cyanobacterium of some kind by vertical evolution, and this would have uh, given rise to plants and algae, obviously, but all the other eukaryotes. So this model involved um, a good deal of secondary loss of photosynthesis, the idea that the ancestral state of eukaryotes was, was phototrophy. Uh, Margla said, uh, no, um, that's not true. She referred to this as the botanical myth, uh, mainly because it was the botanists who um, proposed or were endorsing this idea. Margulis's uh, model is on the right, 
and it involves, as you can see there, um, uh, independent, multiple independent uh, horizontal movements, uh, acquisitions, if you will, uh, of different prokaryotic lines, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and again, the flagella. So uh, can we use uh, molecular sequence data to test whether which of these two hypotheses is likely to be the case? Uh, obviously, we can. And, and I'll just briefly tell you about some of the earliest attempts to do so. Uh, this is a picture of the late uh, Carl Woese, who you will know uh, as the, uh, discovery of the, uh, the discoverer of the third domain of life, uh, the archaea, or archaebacteria. Uh, in the uh, 60s, uh, Woese and, and a group of uh, laboratory technicians, including this person, Linda Bonin. Uh, Linda is a retired professor at the University of Ottawa in, in Canada. Um, they developed a technique called uh, RNA cataloging, and um, almost no one in this room under the age of 50 will probably have ever heard of this, uh, let alone actually carried it out. Uh, it, it very quickly... Um, uh, disappeared when Fred Sanger's uh, dideoxy chain terminator sequencing um, came on board in the in 1970s. Um, but uh, at the time, this was the only game in town. Uh, it worked as follows. You grew up cultures of organisms in the presence of obscene quantities of radioactive P32, uh, amounts that uh, would not be uh, allowed to be used in, in a lifetime in, in a lab, let alone one experiment, I'm told. Um, the ribosomal RNAs in the cell were labeled under such conditions because cells churn out ribosomal RNAs all the time. Uh, those labeled molecules could be purified, uh, digested using particular enzymes that cleave nucleic acids in a specific fashion, and you could run the material on a gel uh, and produce a, 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 a 2D gel as such as you see there. Now, uh, if you really know what you're doing, you can actually read the information on such um, gels, and you can see little snippets there. So th that's called RNA cataloging. The, the nucleic acid sequences were obtained um, in little snippets of six, seven, or eight nucleotides at a time. A and uh, at that point, there were, there were probably less than 10 people on the whole planet who could actually uh, interpret this data. Woese was, uh, of course, one of them, and he did most of the work in the lab interpreting the, the data, although his technicians did all the, all the hard work. So this uh, idea was uh, used, first used, to collect the very first molecular sequence data from organelles. Now, uh, for Doolittle, you can see in the top left there, he looks uh, rather different today, but um, back then he looked pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, the story goes that um, Linda Bonin, who I mentioned a moment ago, was uh, coming to Dalhousie and she was looking for a job and she asked Carl Woese who she ought to go and work for and he suggested Ford, Ford Doolittle. And uh, Ford and Carl knew each other from uh, working in the same uh, department in, in the U.S. Uh, they didn't collaborate. Uh, I'm told they mostly drank beer together. But Carl uh, thought a lot of Ford and uh, suggested that Linda go and work uh, in that lab. And so she did, and she uh, and Ford hatched the idea that they would apply this RNA cataloging technique to compare the cyanobacterial uh, sequences to those of chloroplasts. And there was a very clear uh, evolutionary signal there. Uh, the same was done for mitochondria by Michael Gray in the bottom right. Um, and this was work done in the same um, uh, department and building that I currently work. Uh, and this, this was in the uh, early 1970s, and so there was a whole flurry of papers uh, pointing in the same direction. Now, around 1980, uh, Lynn Margulis organized a symposium in New York, and that's the title of it. Now, the, the first molecular sequence data that I've been mentioning, um, sort of mid-1970s or so, and naively I would have thought that once people had the data in hand, that, well, uh, they would, they would uh, realize that, or of course organelles came from um, 
prokaryotes, the molecular uh, sequences tell us so. But in fact, this is 1980, so five years after that, and you can go and look at the abstracts of all of the papers that were published asso associated with this uh, event, and it was about 50-50 whether the people present at that meeting uh, actually believed the uh, gene trees or not. So still, there were alternative um, interpretations of the data, and so it wasn't as though the answer just leapt off the page. Um, some people inherently bought into the idea and others did not. By the time that this paper was, uh, review article was published in uh, 1982, the answer to the question was uh, yes in the case of mitochondria, or chloroplasts rather, and probably in the case of mitochondria. The case for cyanobacterial origin for Chloroplast was always uh, quite strong on, on molecular grounds, uh, less so for mitochondria, but um, gradually that came along as well. And by about the late 1980s, really there was no other explanation for the observations in, in hand. And labs all over the world collecting not only molecular data, but biochemical, molecular, and, and ultrastructural data. So, so really the endosymbiont hypothesis became endosymbiotic theory in the formal sense of the word. So I think it's um, safe to conclude, uh, make the following conclusions from, from what I've said so far. It's, it's very difficult in science and in life, I suppose, to have a truly original idea. Uh, timing is almost uh, everything. Margulis was... Uh, in the position to uh, be proposing her ideas at a time that new technologies were coming along and could be used to actually test those, those ideas, and she was proven right uh, two, on two out of three. Uh, the parenthetical almost there, of course, is that um, timing isn't everything. Um, Jostein's paper was uh, not uh, gen you know, generally acknowledged, and uh, for reasons that are, are not clear to me. Um, uh, the paper is, is very poorly understood, even by specialists uh, who work in the area of symbiosis. Many people will never even have heard of him, let alone know about that, that paper, which is a, a real shame. Now, it is possible, the last conclusion, it's possible to have too much of a good thing. Um, I've mentioned flagella. Uh, on the one hand, Margulis went on to write uh, lots of... Uh, interesting and influential science books, uh, many of which I, I love. Um, she uh, felt so strongly that symbiosis was a driving force in, in biology that um, she started to propose the idea, as Wallen had actually uh, in the 1920s, that, that even uh, speciation in, in organisms such as plants and animals was the result of symbiosis. So um, this is an idea, I, I gather, that very few uh, people studying plants and, and animals will uh, agree with. So it's all well and good to be able to say that mitochondria and chloroplasts are of endosymbiotic origin. Uh, does that mean that we understand how the eukaryotic cell evolved? Uh, the answer is no. Um, there are lots of features of eukaryotic cells, uh, as you can see in this cartoon from uh, De Duff, um, that we still don't understand. Uh, the, the nucleus, the endomembrane system, um, various aspects of eukaryotic cell biology, uh, we are in some ways no further ahead now in understanding their uh, evolutionary origin than we were uh, 30 or 40 years ago. And we can summarize the, the current status of the field with respect to eukaryogenesis as follows. Um, there are sort of two competing camps. Um, which came first, the mitochondrion or the eukaryotic cell? And uh, w there are strong views on either side, and we, we uh, have no consensus in the field, despite having hundreds and th even thousands of genome sequences. The, the answer to the question simply has not emerged. Um, there was a time, certainly when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, late 90s, uh, when there was much interest in organisms such as the ones on the left here, uh, 
organisms that were thought at the time to be primitively amitochondriate, that is, they were eukaryotes, uh, they had a nucleus and all of the various bells and whistles, but they were thought to have diverged from the main eukaryotic line prior to the acquisition of mitochondria. We now know that that is not uh, true. All known eukaryotes uh, today are thought to have evolved from uh, mitochondriate ancestors, even if they uh, have a highly reduced mitochondrion, or in, at least in one case that we know of, no, no mitochondrion at all. And so the model is, looks something a little bit more like this, where we have clearly a common ancestor of all eukaryotes with a uh, mitochondrion, um, but we're still uh, very unclear on the sequence of events that gave rise to additional features of eukaryotic complexity. We clearly know that mitochondria are of alpha proteobacterial origin, um, and we also have some ideas about the putative archaeal host that might have uh, partnered with that proteobacterium. Some of you be, will be aware uh, of exciting molecular sequence data that uh, come from Thijs Edema and, and colleagues, including uh, scientists at, at Bergen, um, analyzing materials taken from deep uh, in the ocean. This is from Loki's castle. So there is a, a whole uh, wave of new discoveries of organisms that appear to be the closest uh, known uh, lineages to, to the eukaryotic uh, nucleocytoplasmic lineage, and they have uh, collections of genes that were once considered to be uniquely eukaryotic, what are called eukaryotic signature proteins. Now, I should say that these data come from uh, genomic sequences. This is metagenomic sequence data. No one, uh, to my knowledge, has ever seen uh, one of these Asgard archaea. And so it's an open question at what the biology of the, the actual cells are. And it's going to be very exciting to see. I gather they're working hard to bring these organisms into culture. And so it's uh, exhilarating to think that there are new lineages uh, still out there that can help us fill gaps uh, between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So I'm going to move a little closer to my own uh, scientific home and talk about photosynthesis. Um, so far we've been talking about uh, what we would refer to as primary endosymbiosis. So this is the idea that chloroplasts uh, evolved from cyanobacteria by endosymbiosis. That's in the top left. Um, but we now understand that there are additional levels of complexity in terms of the evolutionary history of chloroplasts. And we're going to hear more about that in the talk that follows mine. Um, that process is referred to as secondary endosymbiosis, and that involves partnership between two different eukaryotic organisms, a heterotrophic host and a organism, an alga, that already uh, has a chloroplast. So that would be a, a what we call a primary plastid-bearing organism. Now, uh, to my knowledge, the first person who um, articulated this possibility is uh, Sally Gibbs. Um, I'll just read this, this quote. She was, uh, she was very knowledgeable about uh, the diverse forms of chloroplasts in nature in different organisms and had long scratched her head over the differences in the number of membranes that surrounded these organelles. She was reviewing a, a paper on uh, uh, mitosis in euglena, the story goes, uh, ultrastructurally, euglena could not be more unlike green algae. Out of the blue, I suddenly realized that euglena wasn't related to green algae at all. It just ate them for dinner. The moment I thought, it, thought of it, I was ecstatic. I knew it had to be true. It explained too many things not to be true. And indeed, as uh, data were collected over the years, we now have come to understand that secondary endosymbiosis has happened on multiple occasions. Uh, one of the lineages that my own lab studies are, are called cryptophyte algae. And these are uh, unusual and revealing in the sense that the nucleus of the engulfed eukaryote still persists in a miniaturized form called a nucleomorph. 
And so we can study the genetic material in these nucleomorphs to learn more about uh, the past evolutionary history of the algae. And I should say too that secondary endosymbiosis is not a sort of an evolutionary oddity. Um, it has given rise to some of the most abundant and important uh, microbes on the planet, things like uh, bloom-forming diatoms, uh, and dinoflagellates on the left there, uh, haptophyte algae, organisms that you can see uh, from outer space. Um, so all of these different types of algal forms have acquired their plastids by secondary endosymbiosis. Now, uh, what's interesting about this process is that the complexity is at the level of the DNA, and this is where we uh, loop back to, to Jostein's uh, insight into what must take place during, the, the, uh, during an endosymbiotic event. So I refer to this as uh, waves of endosymbiotic gene transfer. So moving from left to right, we have genes moving from the progenitor of the uh, chloroplast, so the, the cyanobacterium, into the nucleus of the first eukaryote that acquired that organelle. And every time we have a, a secondary endosymbiotic event, we have the movement of additional genes from one nucleus to the other. So this complicates matters immensely in terms of trying to reconstruct evolutionary history. And if we layer on top of that uh, what's referred to as horizontal or lateral gene transfer, HGT in this cartoon, um, this can happen at various stages of the, the evolutionary trajectory. And so we end up with nuclear genomes that are a mosaic of genes from multiple distinct sources. And we are still, uh, as a field, scratching our head over the uh, precise number of events that have given rise to the current diversity of, of photosynthetic eukaryotes. In blue, uh, the blue arrow is the presumed primary endosymbiotic origin of plastids, but all the other uh, colored names there are lineages that have either, either green or red algal type chloroplasts acquired secondarily, um, and in many cases we simply do not understand how it is that those organisms have become photosynthetic. It could be two, three, uh, as perhaps as many as five or six different endosymbiotic events, and there can even be tertiary endosymbiotic events. So this, this idea of cells within cells inside other cells. It is the reality of uh, of uh, algal diversity on the planet today. Now all of those events are, are for the most part considered to be uh, truly ancient. I'm going to tell you about one uh, very recently evolved photosynthetic organelle. This is the organism I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, Polynella chromatophora. And I like this story for, for various reasons. Uh, it has a, a a, a long history. Uh, it was discovered by uh, the German Robert Lauterborn in the Rhine ri River. Um, he described the organism in 1895. That's a, his picture on the left, um, and on the right is a uh, modern uh, light micrograph, and you can see that he did a pretty good job capturing the accuracy there. What intrigued uh, Lauterborn about this organism, of the, the, the blue-green uh, sausage-shaped entities were, were intriguing, and he uh, went so far as to speculate on their origin. Uh, he saw the, the obvious similarities to cyanophyce or cyanobacteria, and posited that, that they were um, taken up, perhaps taken up as food, or maybe they were even independent organisms. They could even be fully integral uh, compartments within the cell. And he ended by saying that this was a decision uh, uh, about this question must be uh, to the future, um, which is very interesting. The date on this is 1895, and this is a full 10 years before the Marischkovsky uh, paper positing um, endosymbiotic origin of chloroplasts. So this goes back a long way. Um, in the case of Polynella, the future is now. Um, Michael Malconian uh, in Germany, his laboratory succeeded in establishing a 
uh, culture of Polynella in the 1990s. Um, and they collected some of the first molecular sequence data from these green entities. And what was remarkable is that they were indeed cyanobacterial in origin, but they were uh, of distinct origin from chlor uh, canonical chloroplasts. So on the top you can see are where the plastid sequences fall within uh, cyanobacterial diversity. Uh, Pollinella, the organism that I'm telling you about now, uh, its sequences are down in the bottom. So a completely independent uh, connection to a distinct cyanobacterial group. Uh, over the past 10 years or so, there's been a, a flurry of debate and discussion about what are these sausage-shaped entities? Should we call them uh, endosymbionts, should we call them organelles, uh, genomes have been sequenced, um, and people have studied the uh, nuclear genomes of the organisms. What they have shown, in a nutshell, is that genes have indeed moved from the chromatophore to the nuclear genome of the host organism. That's important. Uh, and what's also important is that protein targeting actually takes place. So a recent paper by uh, Eva Novak, and Dusseldorf and, and her colleagues have shown that there are in fact hundreds of proteins that are targeted to this chromatophore. So it, uh, strictly speaking, can be uh, defined as, as a, an organelle. Um, whether we choose to use the word plastid or chloroplast or not is, is a, a matter of taste, but it's clearly a very recently evolved, fully integrated photosynthetic organelle completely separate to the one that evolved uh, a billion or more years ago in the case of plants and algae. Now, um, I'm interested in diversity and when I, uh, every time I get down about the, our lack of progress in the field, I remind myself of uh, all the, the wonders uh, yet to be discovered. Uh, we've talked about some of them already, the Asgard archaea, uh, Polynella is a, an old story, but one that's recently had fresh life uh, breathed into it. And uh, when we think about the diversity of microbes in nature, I think it's fair to say that uh, we don't know enough to know how much we don't know, which is uh, something that I try to impress upon my students. The very last thing I'll say is to bring this back to where we began thinking about lichens. Uh, some of you will have taken, uh, have objected to what I said about a lichen being a partnership between two organisms. Um, this is work from John McCutcheon um, in the US and uh, to Toby uh, Spribill and they recently published a paper in Science showing that macro lichens, at least a large chunk of, of lichen diversity, is in fact a, a tripartite relationship, uh, algae and two very distinct forms of fungi. So here's an organism or group of organisms that we've known for uh, more than 100 years and it has escaped our attention that there were in fact three different types of organisms, not two. So. Uh, quite remarkable. With that, I'll just conclude by uh, saying thanks again for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for a very, uh, um, what's the word in English? Um, enlightening um, speech. Are there any questions from the audience? John, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Lynn Margulis had uh, posited the, the flagella and cilia as another endosymbiotic event uh, that has never been proven. Uh, I know that my father also discussed this in his unpublished paper, uh, the possibility, and that uh, to prove it you need to find DNA in the flagellum. Uh, has it been tried, or has it not just, has, is it so that nobody just has looked at it? <laughs> 
Hey, good question. Well, so, so Anders is asking about the flagellum and the, the history of uh, testing that idea. I suppose I should say that just because a, an organelle doesn't have DNA doesn't necessarily mean that it's not of endosymbiotic origin, although that's sort of the, the gold standard. Uh, it's difficult to, to uh, test it definitively, and certainly uh, almost every membrane-bound organelle in a eukaryote over the years has been posited to be of endosymbiotic origin. Um, you know, the lysosomes, the nucleus, so there, there's lots of uh, ideas there. Um, in the case of the flagella, yes, it has been um, proposed that there was, in fact, nucleic acids associated with flagella. Uh, there might be some experts in the room aware of some data, I think it's in the 1980s, that suggested uh, DNA associated with basal bodies. And this at the time was, um, obviously, Lynn Margulis was a, was a fan of that idea. Uh, it turned out, uh, my understanding is that turned out to be an artifact. Um, so, so sort of moving forward in time, in the long run, there's really been no uh, evidence of DNA um, associated with the flagella or apparatus. Um, people have looked for the presence of spirochete genes. So she posited that spirochetes were the, the donor of, of the flagella. There are genes in nuclear genomes, if you look hard enough, that have some spirochete signatures. but when you consider what is known about all of the different types of bacteria, there are lots of different signatures there. So you would have to, it, it's not a signal that rises above background. So, so the short answer is there's been really been no convincing evidence. People have tried hard, but uh, it's an idea that just has not taken hold. Yeah. Other questions? Thanks, John, for a wonderful talk. Um, plastids and chloroplasts are, and you showed it very nicely, have uh, arisen several times, you could say, uh, although there is a primary event. Uh, mitochondria, they often are thought to be, uh, only have uh, arisen once. Do you have any comments or any new thoughts about these uh, two different organelle types? Right. Thanks for the, the question. Um, I don't have anything insightful about why mitochondria evolved only once um, and chloroplasts, you know, multiple times. Um, although if, if, if the essence of a eukaryotic cell is a mitochondrion, then by definition there could only have been one from the beginning. Um, we, most people in the field believe that chloroplasts uh, also evolved once by primary endosymbiosis. Pollinella is an interesting, intriguing exception, uh, although very recent origin. So, so really we're talking about singularities, chloroplasts on the one hand and mitochondria. Um, why that is so? There, there's more questions than answers. Secondary endosymbiosis, I think, you know, probably three or more times. Um, people sometimes ask me, have mitochondria moved, uh, been transferred by secondary into symbiosis from eukaryote to eukaryote? And I'm not aware of any cases of that. Although, strictly speaking, um, would we know it to see it? I think mitochondria are, again, all eukaryotes had mitochondria. So, uh, it's perhaps not the same need in terms of what the benefits of photosynthesis for, for it to spread. So, uh, so the short answer is no. It's a great question, but um, it's one of those mysteries there. I mean, singularities are very difficult things to grapple with but for, for evolutionary biologists. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that if you have further questions, I will encourage you to ask them during the break uh, after the next talk. Um, so, I just want to give you some flowers. Unfortunately, the book has not been translated to English yet. So, um, I hope that you can enjoy some nice Norwegian chocolate instead. Right, thank thank you, you very much. much.